Hello, uh, we're going to be looking today at Acts chapter 9 and verse 7 and Acts chapter 22 and verse 9. The book of Acts, which is written by Luke, who also wrote the Gospel of Luke, we have the account of Saul, who was a persecutor of the Christians, becoming the Apostle Paul and becoming a Christian in Acts chapter 9 and Acts chapter 22 and in Acts chapter 26. Uh, but skeptics say that the accounts in Acts 9 and 22 are contradictory. So, for example, Shabir Ali, when I debated him, uh, made this argument that these two passages are contradictory and therefore the Bible cannot be true because God is a God of truth and cannot contradict himself. Now, before we look at the specific passage, we need to consider that when somebody is making the argument that two things are contradictory, the burden of proof is upon that person to demonstrate affirmatively that uh, something is both being affirmed and denied in the same sense at the same time and in the same way. So, um, it's if I am saying, so this, this contradicts this. I'm the one that needs to prove that there's no reasonable way for both of the statements to be true. The burden of proof is on me to make that, make that proof. So, when uh, skeptics are affirming that the Bible is contradictory, they're the ones that need to prove that two statements that they allege are contradictory are necessarily both affirming and denying the same propositional truth in the same sense at the same time. Uh, while the Christian may be able to show that these two things are not contradictory uh, and give a particular explanation that is the correct explanation, but the burden is actually not on the person that is saying things are non-contradictory. The burden of proof is on the person who is making the positive affirmation that two things are contradictory to show that they are necessarily saying the same thing is true and false at the same time and in the same way. So let's see if this is the case in the account of Paul's conversion. So the alleged contradiction is between Acts chapter 9 and verse 7 and Acts chapter 22 and verse 9. So Acts 9 7 says, and the men which journeyed with him, so these are the companions of the apostle Paul or Saul at this point who became the apostle Paul, uh, stood speechless hearing a voice but seeing no man. So, and then Acts 22, 9 says, Paul is speaking, and he says, And they that were with me saw indeed the light and were afraid, but they heard not the voice of him that spake to me. So uh, the skeptics will say, well, okay, so the companions of Paul, did they hear the voice or of the risen Christ, or did they not hear the voice of the risen Christ? So here is the contradiction. Acts 9 says they heard the voice of Christ. Acts 22 says they did not hear the voice of Christ. And so clearly, this is a contradiction. It's affirming that the same uh, content is both true and false in the same sense and in the same way, so therefore uh, the Bible cannot be um, infallible revelation from the God of truth. So is this the case? Are Acts 9, 7, and Acts 22, 9 necessarily affirming and denying the same propositional content in the same sense at the same time? Well, first thing, the first thing we should point out is the Greek word translated here uh, can have more than one sense. Now, we're going to actually see these two texts are definitely not contradictory. The skeptic does not, is not able to meet the burden of proof to, to prove that these are both affirming and denying the same thing in the same sense. And so, uh, first of all, uh, the word translated here, uh, the verb to hear in Acts 9 and 22, 9, uh, akuo, can both signify to have or exercise the facility of hearing, so just hearing noise, and it can also mean to hear or understand a message, to understand. So it's both used of hearing without understanding, for example, in John 12, 29, and it is used of hearing with understanding, like in Galatians 4, 21 and 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 2. So uh, the word can both um, signify just hearing sounds and also understanding. So that's the first thing we need to keep in mind. Now also, uh, the word translated voice in Acts 9, 7, and 22, 9, can also be translated as sound, and it can refer, according to the standard Greek dictionary, BDAG, it can refer to an auditory effect, a sound, tone, or noise. It can also refer to the facility of utterance, a voice, and it can refer to a language, to a verbal code shared by a community to express ideas and feelings. So, um, several different senses within the semantic range, the range of meaning of the word here, and of the word sound. So even if the Greek 
syntax and the Greek structure were identical in Acts 9 and Acts 22, in Acts 9, 7, Acts 22, 9, you could affirm that Paul's companions heard a sound of Christ speaking, but they did not understand the voice or the language of Christ speaking to Paul. And um, Acts 26 indicates that Paul was speaking in Hebrew, so it's very possible that they heard the sound of Christ speaking to Paul in Hebrew, but they did not understand the words that were being spoken in Hebrew. So that's, um, even if the two passages had exactly the same grammatical construction, you would not be able to prove contradiction. There would be a reasonable explanation of non-contradiction, that they heard the sound, but they did not understand the voice of the language. But uh, even though that would be sufficient of it itself to show that these texts cannot be proved to be contradictory, we can actually say more than that, because the Greek syntax is not only not identical in the two passages, but the Greek syntax actually supports a difference in meaning between the two texts. In Acts 9 and verse 7, the verb akuo, to hear or understand, takes the Greek word phone, voice, sound, or language, in the genitive case. While in Acts 22, 9, the Greek word phone, voice, or sound, is in the accusative case. So in the one passage, um, hear takes the word in the genitive, and the other one it takes it in the accusative. Now, in classical Greek usage, akuo with the genitive means to hear a sound, and akuo with the accusative means to hear with understanding. So there's actually a distinction uh, between just hearing sound and hearing with understanding that is actually in the Greek language that you could very reasonably conclude is being employed in the two passages. So for example, A.T. Robertson in his uh, standard Greek grammar, his uh, grammar of the Greek uh, New Testament in light of historical research writes, it is perfectly proper to appeal to the distinction in the cases and the apparent contradiction between akous and tes men tes phonés, uh, they heard the, the uh, sound, and tein de phonén uk aku usin, understood not the voice or language. The accusative, case of extent, accents the intellectual apprehension of the sound, that's Acts 22.9, while the genitive, specifying case, calls attention to the sound of the voice without accenting the sense, so that's Acts 9.7. The word akuo here itself has two senses which fall in well with this case distinction. One to hear, the other to understand. Compare uh, huuk ekusan, they did not hear, and meuk ekusan, Romans 10, 8, 10, 14, 10, 18. And yet the genitive can be used where the sense is meant though not stressed, as in uh, ekusaphonase, Acts 22, 7, but ekusenphonane, Acts 9, 4, and 26, 14. So Robertson says this distinction is what's going on in his uh, standard Greek grammar. And also Nigel Turner, another Greek grammarian, his grammatical insights in the New Testament, uh, supports the view that the accusative involves an understanding of the object while the genitive merely records the physical hearing of it. So that is definitely an option. So and not only are the two, the two texts wouldn't be able to be proved to be contradictory even if they had identical Greek syntax, but they don't have identical Greek syntax. They actually have... Uh, different Greek syntax, which supports the uh, possibility that the one text is referring to hearing the sound, while the other one is referring to understanding the voice or language of the risen Christ. Furthermore, there's other syntactical distinctions that are found in the two passages as well. So um, in Acts 9 and verse 7, after it says that they heard the sound, Paul's companion, we have the word uh, see or perceive, used right afterwards in Acts 9 and verse 7. And that word can signify theoreo uh, as the word. It can, all, it can mean both to observe something, and it can also mean to come to the understanding of something, to perceive, to observe, to find. It's actually translated as perceive twice within Acts itself, in Acts 17.22 and Acts 27.10, while in uh, John 14.17, uh, the Holy Spirit is said to uh, give... Uh, truth to uh, believers and to the apostles while the world cannot perceive or understand that truth. So uh, that verb that's used uh, in Acts 9-7 would also support the view that in Acts 9-7 they just heard the sound without understanding or perceiving what was actually going on. Well, furthermore, uh, in Acts 22-7, 9 and 26-14, the word used for speaking to Paul is indicating a continuing action. So there's a continuing action 
Well, in Acts 22.9, um, heard or understood not from Paul's companions is a point action. So there's a different Greek tense, one that would suggest continuing action and one that would suggest point action, which would support the view that the Apostle Paul experienced the continuing understanding of the voice and language of Christ speaking to him in Hebrew, as Acts 26.14 says, while Paul's uh, companions did not understand as a point action uh, the sound of what was being said by the resurrected Christ. So the continuing action words employ the Greek present tense and the point action words of the Greek aorist tense, which is what you'd expect for continuing action and for a point action. So, um, there's, so that's even further evidence that there's syntactical difference here between the two passages. And there's even more evidence of non-contradiction than that. So uh, first of all, notice as well that in Acts 22, Acts 22, if you read the whole chapter, and if you're going to make an assertion of contradiction, like you should actually have read the book of Acts. Like if you're a skeptic, you're an atheist, you're a Muslim, you're an agnostic, and you're going to say these two texts are contradictory, I hope you've read the book of Acts. I mean, I hope you've read the whole Bible so you actually can get some sense of context here. But if you read all of Acts 22, you'll notice that Acts 22 is Luke's inspired Greek translation of statements that the Apostle Paul actually spoke in Hebrew. He was speaking, giving his testimony in the Hebrew language to crowds of people in Jerusalem. While in Acts chapter 9, we have Luke recording Paul's conversion, and it's not you know, a secondary statement where Acts 9 is just Luke recording Paul's conversion. Acts 22 is Paul speaking Hebrew, translated by Luke into Greek, speaking about his conversion. So if you're going to say that both these statements are contradictory, that they're affirming uh, the same proposition is both true and false in the same sense at the same time, not only would you need to say that you'd have to ignore the Greek differences in the structure, you'd have to say that the Hebrew that Paul spake has to mean only one thing, and that only one thing that it has to mean in Hebrew is what the Greek phrase in Acts 9 meant. So you have to say that a Greek phrase in Acts 9 has to affirm a different content, or excuse me, has to affirm identical content to the content of the Hebrew phrase in uh, Acts 22, which then Paul, when, was translated into Greek by Luke. So um, that's going to be hard to do, to say that in two different languages, uh, two particular structures not only can mean the same thing, but they are necessarily expressing exactly the same idea. So that's also... Uh, problematic if you're going to say these two uh, passages are necessarily contradictory. So what I think these two texts are clearly saying is Acts 9 and verse 7 is saying that Paul's companions heard the sound of the resurrected Christ speaking, while in Acts 22, Paul's companions did not understand the voice or the language of um, the resurrected Christ. So I think that's what it is. But even if you don't like that explanation, you say, you know what, I think that explanation is not good. I don't like it. I want a different explanation because I just want one. Well, there's actually multiple other ways you could explain these texts as non-contradictory, even if you don't like what I think is clearly the correct explanation. So uh, for example, uh, we already mentioned that there is a continuing action verb tense used in Acts 22, 7, 9, and 26, 14 in relation to Paul's hearing the voice, saying, or speaking to him, while the, uh, Paul's companions hearing or understanding not has a point action. So you could also say, well, uh, Paul continued to hear what Christ said in a complete message to him, while Paul's companions only heard the sound or the voice for a moment, but didn't hear the entire message. So you could also say that is a way to show these two texts are, are non-contradictory. So if you want to say that they are necessarily contradictory, you have to show not just that um, it's not, it's, you have to show it's impossible that the one text is saying they heard the sound and the other one is saying they understood the voice, which can't be done. You would also have to show it's impossible that the one text would be affirming that Paul's companions only heard for a moment and the other one is saying that they heard, uh, Paul heard the whole message and that can't be done. And even if you don't, let's say you don't, you know what, I don't like that explanation either. I want a third way to show these are non-contradictory. I'm not going to believe it unless I have at least three ways to show they're non-contradictory. Well, here you go. Here's a third way. So Daniel Wallace, who doesn't like the hear and understand explanation, which I think is the correct explanation, but he doesn't like it. Uh, what he says is he says it's still most reasonable to conclude these count, accounts are not presenting contradictory views about what Paul's companions heard. 
The most probable solution sees the various traditions that Luke gathered, including Acts 26.14, as from different sources. Luke then compiled the information in a conservative manner, even to the point of preserving much of the wording of his sources, where both akuo, to hear or understand, and phone, voice or sound, carry different nuances in each source. Hence, what looks like a contradiction is in reality evidence of Luke's reticence to drastically alter the traditions as handed down to him. So even if you don't like the hear-understand distinction, even if you think that it doesn't matter that one passage employs a continuing action uh, idea and the other one doesn't, you could just say that Luke is very conservative in his use of sources, and one source uh, has hear and um, voice used in one sense, and the other one has hear and voice used in a different sense. So even though the uh, light, the words are the same words, they're identifying different ideas. And so if you want to show that these, uh, the Bible is not true and these passages are contradictory, you also have to show that this is impossible. And this third explanation also cannot be shown to be impossible. And we have a fourth explanation. So Craig Keener, in his very, very large commentary on Acts, says, Yet another possible solution may also arise from the genre of Acts as ancient rather than modern historiography. Ancient historians fleshed out minor details of a simpler account uh, differently on different occasions. Such variation could also function as a deliberate rhetorical device. The difference is less consequential than modern arguments often make it. It is certainly less than many differences between accounts of the same events in Josephus' War and his Antiquities of the Jews. That Josephus composed differently even in such elite works, each potentially read by the same audience as the other, suggests that ancient audiences normally saw little problem with and probably often expected such rhetorical variation. The proposed solution may be right or wrong in its, the present instance of Acts 9 and 22, but it certainly falls within what was allowed in ancient historical writing. So um, here, uh, Keener says that Paul, that ancient historiography, they like to not just say things exactly the same way every single time, but instead to... Um, Use, you know, use different words when you're telling something a second time. And that was a rhetorical variation. And so it's not saying something contradictory, but it's just uh, he's giving you the same idea using uh, different words in a different style. And Keener, uh, both Wallace and Keener uh, have questionable uh, views of inerrancy. Keener is, does not believe in the inerrancy of the Bible, so he's not just trying to desperately explain oh, I need to defend the inerrancy of the Bible. He's saying this is an option. Wallace also has questionable views of, of inerrancy, and so he's also certainly not somehow biased towards defending the infallible inspiration of the Bible. So, in summary, it is highly likely that the accounts of Paul's conversion to Christ in Acts 9, 22, and 26 are teaching that Paul's companions heard the sound of Christ speaking, but they did not understand the voice or the language of Christ speaking in the Hebrew language to the Apostle Paul. While this solution is highly probable, even if one for the sake of argument were to set it aside, there are numbers of other easy solutions to this alleged contradiction between Acts 9 and 22. So this is not a very good argument for the Bible being contradictory. It's uh, easily explained away um, and easily shown not to be contradictory. So why do people continue to allege that texts like Acts 9 and 22 are contradictory when you simply can't prove that they are? And there's not only can you not meet the burden of proof to show that they are, you can actually give great evidence that positive evidence that they're not. Why do people still use arguments like this? Well, sometimes it's ignorance. Sometimes it's ignorance of contrary evidence. Uh, so Maybe if you're an atheist or who doesn't study the Bible because you don't think it's true, you're a Muslim who doesn't study the Bible because you don't think it's true, um, you don't actually know that the syntax is different, that there's different, uh, all these different linguistic features are different. You don't know about these potential solutions uh, because you just don't care because you don't think it's true. So, oh, good, I found a contradiction, great. And so it might be just ignorance is an explanation. Uh, it also sometimes is ignorance of what's involved in the burden of proof, that the person uh, offering an alleged contradiction is the one who has to prove that not only are uh, there linguistic similarities, but that the same propositional content is both being affirmed and denied in the same sense at the same time. 
So ignorance is, an, is one explanation. Another ex explanation is a culpable lack of study. And this can be connected to ignorance because if you're ignorant, ignorant about the solution here, it really is your fault. I mean, these solutions are not very hard to find. Uh, they have been talked about in uh, scholarly uh, defenses of biblical inerrancy for years and years. And it's really not that hard to find out that these texts aren't contradictory. So it, it could be a culpable lack of study. Uh, somebody just doesn't care enough to find out they're non-contradictory. He wants to believe they're contradictory, so he'll just grab onto something and say, oh good, I found a contradiction, now I don't need to believe the Bible, and now I get to live how I want, or I get to do my own thing, I get to follow my own religion. And so it could be a culpable lack of study. And that's also connected to the possibility that uh, someone's worldview predisposes them to want to believe uh, that the Bible is contradictory. So if you're an agnostic, if you're an atheist, if you're a deist, if you're a Muslim, if you, are a, uh, you have some non-Christian view of the world, well, you want to not have to listen to the Bible. And so if you actually can say the Bible it cannot be true because it's contradictory, it can't be infallible revelation from a God who gives only truth, then you, know, you don't need to listen to it because you have your reason why you don't need to listen. So if your worldview predisposes you to not want to believe the Bible, then uh, you'll find something like this, and you're going to say, okay, great, I get to hold on to this, and I don't need to listen to the Bible. I don't need to believe that it's non-contradictory. So um, one thing that is worth pointing out, though, uh, there's many people who do not want to listen to the Bible in this world. Uh, many, many people, and there's many, many people who do want to listen to the Bible. But the fact that people who are attacking the Bible are using something like Acts 9-7 and 22-9 why aren't they using something better? I mean, this is, this is very easy to show as non-contradictory. This, this doesn't even come close to meeting the burden of proof. Why don't they have something better to use? Why are they using something so easy to refute? Well, because there isn't anything better to use, because the Bible is non-contradictory, because it actually is God's word. It actually is true. So skeptics need to use stuff like this, which is a bad argument, uh, because there isn't anything better. And so if you want to make the argument that the Bible is contradictory, you just have to hope people are ignorant or they don't study or, you know, whatever, and give out arguments that are actually not valid because there are no valid arguments against the Bible because it actually is the infallible truth of uh, the one true God. So thank you for taking the time to uh, study this alleged contradiction in the Bible today, and may it help you if you are a uh, Christian to strengthen your faith in the Word of God. And may it cause you, if you're a non-Christian, to consider that maybe these alleged contradictions, maybe they aren't contradictions at all. And maybe if you study a little bit more deeply and a little more thoroughly, you'll find out that um, the God of truth actually does reveal non-contradictory propositional revelation in his infallible word of the Holy Bible. Let's close this video in prayer. Lord, we thank you for the truth of your word. And I pray that you'd help those that watch this to see that this, these two texts are not contradictory and that they would either come to the knowledge of uh, your word as the infallible uh, truth that it is, or if they are already uh, born again believers in you, that they would be strengthened in their faith as they see that alleged arguments against the Bible are very poor. And we pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen.